Hi guys, this is Matt, and I'm here with Bob today, who's a Chess Goals member, and we will be looking at three of Bob's games from a slow chess league. How are you doing today, Bob? I'm good, thanks, Matt. Yeah. All right, so this first game, um, this was your first competitive game for over 18 years, is that right? Uh, it is, yeah. I used to play league chess in, in the UK, and I moved jobs, and uh, I never got to start playing again. So uh, with the pandemic, um, I just felt like you know starting up again, and there was online tournaments. So uh, I joined the ECF again and played in this tournament, the 4NCL Congress. Very cool. Um, was there a certain thing that kind of spurred your interest in chess again, like the Queen's Gambit or chess.com events? Like, did you did something catch your eye? Um, not particularly. I've never been far away from chess. I try and solve the puzzles and the paper and things like that. And uh, every holiday, you know, sort of try and think about starting starting up again but just never finding the time so with the pandemic it, it just thought I'll, I'll give it another go and um but yeah i watched the queen gambit maybe that was a subliminal start again i suppose yeah it just yeah being at home a lot uh gets you ready to play chess <laughs> that's for sure so here we see uh, game number one your opponent played d4 and here you mentioned that you've been playing the Black Lion defense um, and also the Killer Dutch. So are those still kind of the, the two main systems that you aim for? I I I picked up a book and I, I my opening knowledge is not great and I was a bit worried. I just get blown away in the opening. So I I I'd, I'd I'd played the Black Lion years ago and I'd, I sort of knew some of the ideas and I just studied them before the. Um, before the game so i just felt more confident with that so i went with that um because it would seem more flexible and and was good for a lot of different uh white moves really yeah and i think it's kind of it's an offbeat opening too right so your opponents might not have theory prepared for it um and you'll be yeah. ready yeah so this f4 um i, I was fearing this one um and an interesting fact about this tournament, I'd, I'd got a high rate, higher rating on Lee Chess, and they'd put me into the under 2000 categories. So I was playing somebody who I thought was reasonably high, highly rated according to the, um, the UK system. So um, he played a sharp line here, and I couldn't really remember this, but um, I, I just went with what I could remember. I'd actually studied a game on this, so um, I wasn't completely off. Um, yeah, th these first six moves all looked good to me. I think you're kind of following the theory uh, up until mm -hmm. move seven. And you mentioned here that d5 was probably the strongest move, right? Getting this pawn break in right away. Yeah, this is rustiness and lack of lack of knowledge and, and not trusting the ideas. And I thought, well, I need I need to do something here. And I just played uh, played the, the bishop, but I really needed to play uh, yeah d5. I think. Yeah, and, and one thing I would say about opening choice from the black side, um, playing something like the perk defense or the black lion or the modern does sort of give white the option to play a very aggressive line against you, which means you'll have mm. to, to memorize quite a bit of theory. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the black lion, but um, like based on your playing style, I think you might have more fun playing something like the French defense or the Caro Khan, where you can play it from more of a solid base and it doesn't give your opponent as much of a chance to go for like a real back and forth tactical battle right out of the opening. Yeah, I mean, many years ago I played the modern and I was always facing the Austrian attack and just, <laughs> just been, been whomped. And uh, yeah, this, this, this game started to bring back those memories, really. So. <laughs> yeah, and your opponent could have gone more aggressive here, right? Like you mentioned right here g4 was playable um, yeah no that that seeing that in the afterwards is, is making me really think do i do i want this because this this just look i looked at this on the board and this is just chaos <laughs> I know, you know <laughs> well what's crazy here is uh i was running this with stockfish and there is a move here bishop to g4 this equalizes according to stockfish and and just look at how crazy this line is bob so we hit the queen check and then it's like each side is just taking pieces back and forth, taking pawns back and forth. 
And this is almost all forced, like best move, only move type mm. moves. And in the end, we're even material. And most both queens are out, out checking the kings. <laughs> it's just, it's craziness. <laughs> Yeah, n not not in my first game back after 18 years. This would be too much, I think. <laughs> right. It's like getting back into running and just jumping into a marathon or something. <laughs> yes, yeah, good analogy. So. so here your opponent plays h3. Um, you mentioned that this is a hook, but since the white king is not over here on the king side, um, mm. nothing you can really take advantage of. d5, that's a good move. Okay, so now let's kind of... Uh, Fast forward a little bit. So here you're gambiting a pawn, um, but you do have some play for it. So you might not have a full pawn worth of compensation, but you definitely have some counterplay. Okay, so I think this is a critical point. I like to think about these positions in terms of imbalances when possible. So right now in terms of material, we're down a pawn. Um, what are the imbalances that are in your favor currently? What would you say? Um, well, I've got an open um, or C file against uh, White's White's King, um, uh, which I could place my rook on if I develop my um, uh, my bishop. Uh, my knight's reasonably well placed. Um, White has got. Uh, Queen and Rook on a D file, so it's got sort of control. Um, that's about what I can see at the moment. So. Yeah, so I think based on those things you mentioned, um, trying to attack the White King would be good. And if the Queens are going to come off the board, what you'll want to play for is a lot of activity. So you might not necessarily be able to get your pawn back. Um, but if you can get your pawn back, or if you can get a, a lot of activity in return for the queen trade, then I think the queen trade is okay. But here you really don't want to do, let's say queen takes d5 right away, right? Because that will simplify the, the winning chances for white. Like you won't have as much counterplay. That, that was my feeling, yeah. So then, yeah, so your opponent's trying to, trying to force the issue here, queen to d6. Um, and here you took queen takes d6. So I think this is probably like takeaway number two so far. The first one was uh, move seven d5. You know, finding this move in the opening is kind of critical because white did have a pretty large advantage. Um, and this is the second takeaway that I had. Queen takes d6. Um, I feel like this makes the game too easy for white because we go into this queenless endgame and now those imbalances aren't as much in your favor, right? You don't really have the attack against the white king. Um, in the minor pieces, it's only a, a small advantage for you, maybe. Like if your bishop gets out and your knight's strong on c5, white's minor pieces are almost as good as yours. Yeah, I, I can't say I'd, um, I liked it, but I, I was struggling a bit for time and struggling to think where where else to move the queen to, really. You have a cool move here with the knight. Did you consider knight to e4 in the game? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, maybe I, I looked at that um, afterwards, but I, I don't think I realistic. Or if I already did see it, I'd, uh, I probably didn't calculate it through. What do you think about it uh, looking at it now? Because at first it does look a little bit strange. After queen takes queen, we are doubling our pawns, right? Hmm. Um, yes, but you've got a couple of threats, I suppose. You've got the fork of the rooks, uh, it's quite central. Uh, you've got an outpost, I suppose. Um, you know, it could be supported by a five um, at a later stage, um, and, and it can't be, um, it can't be got rid of easily. Uh, the bishop would have to swap off, or the other knight would have to swap off for it. Right. So, so I think a big positive here is in the game, as we'll see, you did the right thing, Bob. Like you played aggressive with these minor pieces and you, you created threats and that led to your opponent making a blunder. And I think this line is uh, essentially it's just like a quicker way of what you did in the game. 
So because white's taking us on b6, that does open up the rook takes a2 threat in addition to these threats over here on the on the king side. Okay. So after queen takes d6, rook takes, um, these next three moves I was very impressed by. I think he did the exact right thing here, knight to e4, hitting the rook, knight to g3, hitting the other rook, and also eyeing this bishop on f1. And now bishop f5. So you did a beautiful job just getting the, that knight and bishop on good squares, attacking your opponent, and then here comes the big blunder, bishop to d3. <laughs> what did you think about this move? Yeah, so I was, I was happy to see that because I've, I'd seen it um, beforehand. And I thought, well, he can't play that move. Um, and I thought he was going to, you know, I'm, I was wondering how to get my knight out, you know, at some point if I was being threatened, but I, I thought it couldn't be easily dislodged, and I was quite happy with it there because I thought it was a bit of a nuisance. Um, he said afterwards he thought my, my knight was just out of the game, effectively. Um, but he, you know, he banged he banged the screen after his next move, and then pushed out. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Did you have cameras on during the game? Um, no, but we, uh, it was on Lee Chess and we just texted, um, commentary after the game. It's a oh. very kind, you know, um, player, you know, cause I had not played and we were just discussing them after the game. So. Okay. Yeah. So he had his guard down with this knight, uh, E2 check threat. Mm -hmm. So you, I think you did a nice job there because you actually increased your opponent's odds of making that blunder by playing active, right? If you would have just played... To trade rooks or something a little bit slower, um, your opponent's not going to make a blunder that large. So now we get to this interesting end game. You trade rooks, which I think is a good idea. Now we have a rook against knight. Um, let's go forward a few more moves. Or actually, we could stop here. Okay, f6. So let's talk about the plans from your perspective. So what should your plan be here to, to try to convert this position to a win? I think I, well, my, my idea uh, now, I suppose, would be to get my, um, my rook uh, against the, the white pawns you know, on the second, the second rank on, um, uh, potentially. Um, I, in the game, I was sort of shut out. Oh, that's what I was trying to do. Um, and I was shut out of it uh, by by the knight. I couldn't find an easy inroad into the position. Yeah, so you're exactly right. You want this black rook to get either onto the second rank or even the first rank. So I think coming up, we'll see there are a few chances to get your rook down to the first rank, and I think maybe your opponent was more focused on the second rank. But as soon as this rook can get behind the pawns back here, it can very easily swing all the way across the board. And the king and knight are much too clumsy and slow to really defend everything. So that should be the strategy. At all costs, get your rook behind the pawns because uh, once you create that scenario, your rook will be able to, to capture pawns much quicker than white can threaten any of your pawns. Yeah. And when it comes to studying endgames, um, you know, like take this game, I don't think necessarily it's beneficial to like find a rook and knight chapter of an endgame book. Yeah, I think this is something that the value comes from practical play. Like which endgames did you see in a slow game where you had some time to think? Um, here you were a little bit low on time, but then try to learn from those endgames that you see in, in your games. So like here, I'm already thinking maybe we should try rook to e8 coming down okay. to the e1 square. Because even though we're not immediately on the second, once we get to e1, we have our goal. Yeah, so there's no point in sort of pinning the knight because um, it's not our goal. So that's uh... right because he can kind of wait here. He's waiting now for you to do something. So we'll fast forward a few moves. Yeah, another thing I'll say, um, I liked your f6 move earlier because it was kind of guarding the outpost for the knight. I think, in general, when you have a knight versus rook, keep the pawns a little bit more flexible because what you would actually prefer to do is trade pawns when possible, right? Try to open up these files for your rook. 
Yeah, so if yeah, we go I back. Made, yeah, I made a lot of poor moves that I, I don't think I should have done, and I was um, uh, just making moves because I was short of time and not really confident in what I was needing to do. Yeah, so that's hard. When you're short on time, it's easy to, to push pawns too when you don't know what else to do. Um, one strategy you could try is like g6, f5, h6, g5. That would be an example of a way to try to break these pawns open. Okay. So in the game, you got your king into the center. That's good. And now your rook is very close to getting in. We see this white king guarding three squares. I think you're doing the right thing. Your king is actually posing some problems here, right? You're trying to sneak him in, pressure these pawns, in addition to your rook kind of hitting all three of these squares. It's down to two minutes, you mentioned in the notes, two minutes and 39 seconds. Yeah, I was just I was just trying not to lose on time, so I was just trying to blitz these moves out um, and just trying to avoid, you know, I was scared stiff, really, of the knight uh, forking <laughs> my rook so he would get revenge <laughs> for, for my earlier fork. Um, and this knight was just moving around, <laughs> and I was just... You know, because there were a few times where it's close, and so I was repeating moves, which um, uh, just didn't want to lose on time, really. So. And, and remind me, did you have an increment in this game? Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I can't remember now. I, 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 it might have been ten seconds or something. I think. Okay. Yeah. So not not enough to really build up time on the clock. So yeah. this was probably. A, the last critical moment before the the draw occurred you have that chance to play rookie one um so even though you're low on time if you had that in your mind to keep thinking first rank or second rank i think you would spot it if you had an increment because once that rook gets to e1 there's no way that white can defend all these pawns Yeah, I, I just needed to get it in uh, and, and get it back. I knew what I wanted to do, but um, I just I, I didn't see it. I was just panicking too much with uh, being low on time. And okay, so that brings up a good point. Do you play? How much blitz are you playing in your training currently? Um, not enough. I think it's the only answer. Um, I've I've started. Uh, I've got an idea to sort of join um, um, a few tournaments. On certain days that the uh, ECF run on chess.com, um, but up until now I've just been playing casual blitz games. So maybe you know, maybe four to six a week or something. Uh, um, which I know your training plan says do more, and I, I've noticed the benefit from doing that. I've just not really had the had the time to play. Yeah, and four to six a week is actually pretty good. Um, one thing I like about blitz training is it does help reduce this panic over time you get more and more comfortable having less time on the clock because if you're used to playing let's say a five minute with a five second increment game you know you can finish a classical game in five minutes with a five second increment because you can play a whole game in that period of time mm. so i think it does help uh, it, to... go ahead sir yeah it, sorry to interrupt but yeah it, it, i've noticed because uh, i've noticed even the small amount that i've played has, has really helped because I've got into time trouble in, in a few of the friendly games that you've run through chess goals and I've managed to blitz out a few moves, you know, continually. Um, and they, they've not been rubbish, you know, they've, <laughs> they've, uh, they've, they've helped me get draws in, in games that were, um, essentially objectively lost. Um, right. um but, 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 but I've managed to, um, cause enough trouble <laughs> for my opponent without folding, you know, in, in, um, in the time. Yeah, so. your draw against JD was very impressive. <laughs> the finish, it's not easy. Um, um, yeah, no, I was I was just making things difficult. <laughs> yeah, so I think I would actually add, I didn't think of this uh, when I was doing my prep for today, but I would actually add for you, Bob, playing a little bit more blitz um, and really trying hard to win those games. So like, don't allow yourself to lose and say, oh, it's just because of time. Like really try hard to, to play the highest quality moves possible in those time scrambles and like uh, get used to being more calm under those situations so that it won't feel stressful 
when you get to the games that matter more. Yeah, d definitely, because I, I was very stressed with playing these games in this tournament, but having gone through that, um, I found playing against JD, um, Barnell, um, it was a lot of it was a lot a lot easier um, in that situation, and we'll only get more so as you say if I play more blitz. Yeah, and then one thing I really like here for people watching this video, um, look at what Bob does on his takeaways. Um, it does get a little bit cut off on the screen, but Bob wrote down three takeaways. Number one, move faster and look at his move time from Lee Chess. Look for patterns against his moves. Number two, work on endings. Um, he says he should be more confident and have some techniques to play Rook versus Knight in the end. And number three, wasn't sure about uh, his opening lines and went wrong after a few moves. Not disastrous, but he should learn the ideas better. So I really like that Bob attached these three takeaways to his game. And I mean, th these are a bit subjective, right? So you could give this game to 10 different coaches and they might all have 10 different takeaways and some will be consistent across the coaches. Uh, so I really like the three that you did here, Bob. And I think for number one, the, the time management, playing the blitz would help. Uh, number two for the end game, I think it's more about kind of general advice in having uh, rook activity in the end game. So get your rooks behind the pawns, keep the rook active. Um, but other than that, I, I like your takeaways uh, quite a bit. Okay. It was it was hard to know how to do self analysis. This is honestly the first time that I've um, I've done this, and it probably says why I never improved when I was uh, playing league chess uh, earlier on uh, in my life. But uh, I found it very useful to to do it. Yeah, I think you can improve um, obviously without doing takeaways. But one thing that I just it really struck me when I was looking at chess goals data is how important it is. Like, honestly, if a player is only to do two things to improve, I would say play a lot of games and learn at least one thing from every game. You know, <laughs> you don't probably need to do tactics and strategy and everything else if you just wanted to focus on those two things. It's that important. Wow, that's that's really helpful to know, actually. It's quite quite simple and straightforward message, I suppose, to, to take away from this session. I think. Yeah. All right, so let's jump into round number two. Here we see Bob play to London, um, and you mentioned that your opponent didn't go for one of the more aggressive lines with a quick c5, so that's kind of nice to see as a London player. Yes, yeah. I played to London years ago um, simply because I didn't. I was working and didn't don't have a lot of time for study, so um, it, it worked out quite well but i never like queen b6 <laughs> moves <laughs> so. there is a certain move order you can do um, i was working with a student on this a couple of years ago if you always start out with bishop f4 and e3 like you did well, actually the move order you just did with a quick c3 you can almost always counter queen to b6 with queen to b3 so it's kind of a simple way to counter the you know queen b6 stuff so i, I like your move order here Okay, good, good. And London is something you can play for your whole chess career. Whereas, um, like the Black Lion, I think it's a dynamic opening, but I wouldn't recommend it probably to someone, let's say, 2000 plus. Or maybe you hit that 1800 level and you find you're facing way too many aggressive lines where white's just, you know, plus 0 0.8 or something according to the engine. At that point, you may want to switch to the Black Lion, but I think London, and you can play this any level. Yeah, I've already faced the F4 twice in playing the black line now, so <laughs> it, it, a third time it might it might have to go in the bin, I don't know. <laughs> bin of recycled chess openings. Okay, so here, uh, I really like your, your setup, and I think your opponent has played a bit too passive. What's the biggest weakness in terms of black's minor pieces? What's their worst minor piece? I think the, the the bishop on 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 d7 looks look to me um, just doesn't have any range. It's blocked in, um, so it, it it didn't look good. Yeah. So this um, when I look at this position, this stands out to me the most. This is this imbalance, the d7 bishop okay. against the f4 bishop. You have a big advantage here. The second thing I notice in terms of imbalances is this pawn structure. 
So who has the advantage here? Um, I'm not. I'm not very good on on pawn structures, but I, I hope I did in terms of more more res, um, resilience, I suppose, in my in my pawn structure and options to to recapture. I I would say, um, in terms of just these three, black right. probably has an, a small advantage with the pawn tension. Here's the way I like to think about it. This is how I usually explain it. If you look at the pawn on d4, he has two options. He can sit here and do nothing, or he can capture. How many options does the pawn on c5 have? Uh, well, it, it's, it can move forward or capture. So it's, uh... so it's an additional option, right? Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. And then the other thing to think about is if you are to capture on c5, it removes your only pawn on the fourth rank and it trades your center pawn for a wing pawn. So you would prefer that black captures you on, on d4, right? Then you take it yeah, on c5. Yeah, so I can still retain a pawn in the center. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this pawn tension, it actually favors black. So this is something that your opponent should try to appreciate. Like we'll see in a couple moves, black plays pawn to c4. Once he played c4, I think you have a big advantage. Um, so when I think about chess positions, I'm always thinking imbalances. That's why I'm a big fan of the Silman book. But just in general, trying to compare my pawns versus the opponent's pawns, minor pieces, king safety, um, it really helps in terms of dictating a plan going forward. So knight e5, I like this move a lot. Posting your knight up in the center. Queen to b6. Okay, so here you played... Knight takes d7. This is probably the first takeaway that I have for you in the game. Um, what do you think about knight takes d7? Looking at it. Well, having what I just said, I don't, I don't <laughs> like it. But I wasn't. <laughs> I think I was giving, giving up my, my probably one of my better pieces for the worst piece of, of, uh, of, of blacks on the board. Really. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is uh, helping black out a little bit, getting rid of that d7 bishop. And I don't know if you've noticed in our Discord, Bob, um, in the memes channel, there's like that light square bishop joke. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the bishop right there. Just trapped behind yeah. those pawns. It's kind of like the French defense pawns. <laughs> so here, rook b1 immediately um, would be a good option. Even though it looks passive, putting your rook on b1, really what's happening is you're taking a nine-point piece, queen to b6, and you're um, neutralizing it with a five-point piece. So when you think about it that way, it's not too big of a deal to have the, the rook on b1. Okay, now that's an interesting way of thinking about it. Because also, um, if black were to take on d4, c takes d, which way would you recapture most likely? Um, I'd probably take with my e-pawn, I think. Yeah. What's the reason for that? Uh, just to get, because um, my rook's on e1 one and got open file so, right so you have my main thought here. you have all of these pieces ready to come king side kind of typical in a london and black's pieces are pointing queen side right queens over here rooks over here so what you're doing by playing e takes d4 is you're shutting down the c file so that's another reason i don't mind rook on b1 because we're not going to take back with c. If we were forced to take back with c, now I like this queen here for black because black is quickly getting c file control and our rook is not ready to challenge. But because we're doing e takes d, I'm okay with rook b1. Yeah, I mean, that's like a totally different game. <laughs> yeah. We're taking with the pawn, isn't it? So. so that's the first takeaway. So let's go forward here. After c4, uh, this was a mistake, and you put the question mark here in your notes. You have a really nice advantage now, because you still have this kingside attack, um, and black's queenside play is actually really slow in this position. Yeah, I, I didn't understand these these moves now from black. I, I was looking at them, and I thought, I can't see where uh, the attack's going. So I just thought I'd try and get the freedom by advancing the e-pawn. Yeah, it almost feels like your opponent's uncomfortable here. Like they just don't have a good plan, so they're sort of shuffling. 
and I think you're doing the right thing. This e4, e5 plan, really strong idea by you because now you're closing up the center. And what happens after the center gets closed is now all of these pieces on the queen side are having a lot more difficulty switching over to the king side, whereas your pieces have a lot of flexibility to go to go over king side right now. That's the way it felt like it. So um, in this F4, F5 move, rather, it was, seemed an attempt to shut, shut things down. Yeah, and it does a pretty good job. I think it makes you play it makes you play with a little bit more risk, right? You have to actually probably push the G pawn or really commit your pieces hard to the king side here. Whereas you were looking to play a bit more solid, I think, based on your moves. Um, so F5 was a good practical choice by Black. Yeah, I think so. I think I was too, um, maybe too passive uh, in, in the attack. And yeah, maybe, maybe I should have played G4 or something. Yeah, I think here G4 or Queen H5, like you put in your notes, um, would get you that quick attack. Queen H5 is nice because you you do have this idea of Bishop takes H6, which you mentioned earlier too. Mm. It's kind of a cool move because the black king is so exposed. Okay, so let's look at the game. Knight F1, Queen D8. So in the next few moves, black is trying to defend, but... I think you're doing a good job still increasing the pressure. So you're activating your rook, um, bringing that new piece into the attack. And now you get your queen h5. Yeah, so right here again, we have to think about the imbalances. And maybe it's even back at this point. We would really love to avoid a queen trade, right? Uh, ideally, yes, yeah. Um... But I did it, so I knew, I knew at the time, I thought that was a mistake. Yeah, and you kind of felt like at this point probably that there was no way to avoid it, because um, you also don't want your queen to get trapped out there. That That's also correct as well, yeah, because I was thinking, how do I, how do I avoid it? And I can see a good way of avoiding it. Yeah, so once this happens, um, now in terms of the imbalances, this bishop becomes a lot worse, and we don't have the king side attack. So the kingside attack was your big advantage a few moves back, which we've lost. Um, but what I like now is you didn't you didn't really seem to let this alter your play too much. I think you still played consistently. And your opponent makes a very large positional mistake right here with pawn to f4. And then on the next move, they make another positional mistake with pawn to g5. So there, you can tell black still doesn't have a good plan in mind. And when players don't have a plan, they tend to push their pawns. So look at some of the biggest weaknesses that Black has created, or mistakes, I should say. This, this, pushing the pawn up to g5. Right, they're all pawn advances, it seems. So uh, that's something for your opponent as a takeaway. Don't push too many pawns. Try to figure out a really good plan behind your moves. Each time you push a pawn, could create a weakness. So here you mentioned yeah, seven... Seven minutes left. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was just trying to open open this up and, and just carry on playing. Otherwise, it was just going to be... I couldn't afford to really have a have a long game or get into an ending. So um, given I've got a, a bishop raining down on the, on the black king, I just thought I'd try and open open things up, see where I could get to. Yeah, I love this plan. And, and the black knights are really kind of clumsy over there. It's difficult for them to get to the king side and help out where the action is. Yeah, you mentioned too late to get back into the game. Perfect. And now here we see already that g5 pawn is about to drop. Yeah, this is nice. Mate is coming. Rook to h4. That's a really pretty mate. So knight and bishop guard all those squares. Rook guards this for the checkmate. Yeah, I'd, I'd seen that a few moves out, and uh, I also had the idea of just moving the king up as well and swinging the, the other rook across if, if that was needed, so having the file. Um, a bit worried about my knight being trapped, but it could always come, come back. So it was really just my... I was fortunate my opponent didn't defend so well and, and allowed it, really. Yeah, this was great. <laughs> this is a really good game, Bob. 
Um, in terms of your study plan, are you currently still using the Yusupov book? I, I am, yeah. I think I'm on. Uh, I've just done the, the porn, the porn endings. I'm on five now. I think so. It takes five. Okay. Do, how um, do you enjoy that book? Do you like working through it compared to other books you've used? Uh, I think so. Yeah, because you get to see a number of examples and then get to practice with a with a good number of tests. Uh, I've tried a few other books. I just bought uh, I bought one when I was starting back. Um, it's a Gilesh Chef book, um, but that was a bit more. Um, you had to work a lot harder to get the learning out of the, the books because it'd be presenting games, and you had a less number of examples to solve. Um, and I felt I get more about out of the Yusupov book uh, than than the one I was studying before I joined the Chess Skulls. Okay, that's good. Because um, I I see in your notes here you mentioned the Art of Attack book, which I do think would be a good one for you. But I also don't want to recommend you too many books all at once. <laughs> so Art of Attack would be a good one to keep in mind. Um, I'll just kind of read off your three takeaways here too. So number one, you need to understand and feel more confident in the London system. I think you're, I mean, it looked like you were pretty confident. I think the only uh, change I would say was that knight takes d7 move, but that's more of a, that's more of like a strategic concept than the opening. So I think your opening went great. Uh, your number two was my attack was okay, but your opponent didn't play the best defense. Maybe reading Art of Attack. Um, I agree with that. I think Art of Attack would be a great book for you if you have time to read it. And then your number three was time management was was still bad. And the exchanges going into the end game with no time for thinking. Yeah, so that's... Um, that's something that I think you can think about actively going forward is when your time is getting low, don't always rush to simplify. I think that's the natural thing to do, but oftentimes in chess in general, um, being the side to initiate the trades is not as good as letting the opponent capture you. So like we saw that in game one with the queen trade, if we let the opponent take your queen, that would have actually saved you probably two moves with that kind of rook coming down the A file and your knight going to the king side. Um, so that could be kind of a small takeaway here too, is try not to initiate the trade so quickly unless you calculate it out and see that that's the good option. Um, and then one thing I would add is to think about the imbalances in this game. So the knight for the bishop, like we mentioned, and the pawn for c4 by black, that wasn't uh, your mistake, but like being aware of those types of things that pawn tension playing c4. And then one big positive takeaway I had from this game was that you just played really well. You you held the advantage the whole game, allowed your opponents to make mistakes, um, and without knowing the ratings of the players, if I were to look at this game, I would say white was a few hundred points stronger than black. Like really, you just, you controlled the whole game start to finish. I, I felt I had a good game. I was quite pleased on that. I got I was worried in this tournament to get trounced. So um, I got a draw for my first game and a win for my second. So I hoped to get two out of five. Um, I got one and a half out of five for this tournament, but that, that was about my target. So I was, I was quite happy, really. Yeah, I think it's, this is a really good start. All right, so now let's go to game number three. I'll flip the board. So this is aiming for a black lion defense again. And here we get sort of a Trompowski looking system for white with bishop to g5. Um, okay, so here I'd say this is the first takeaway from this game. You played g takes f in the game. Um, what are your thoughts on taking with the g pawn versus the e pawn here? Um. Well, I was trying to take towards the center, but it, it leaves me with a lingering weakness, um, which was a bit of a pain through the game, I think. So I um, might be tempted to take with the e-pawn if I get this position the next time. Yeah, I think uh, taking with the e-pawn gives you that safety for the king. King, to, king comes to g8 later. He can just tuck nicely behind those pawns.
So here you put two question marks in a row for yourself. Uh, what are your thoughts on these moves? So um, I was just making a mess of it, really, because um, I think I was hoping in Sophia and Chateau, my bishop, and um, didn't really think about um, how I'd defend against a check. And if the bishop doesn't go there, then I've just left loads of holes in my position, uh, which is which is what happened. Yeah, so one thing you can do to think about this position is, uh, again, look at the imbalances. So uh, talk me through, what are the imbalances in this position? Um, well, I suppose I've, I've, got a, I've got a bishop to pair. I haven't really developed any pieces. White has. Um, I've got double pawns. Uh, and I have a, an open G file, um, uh, which could be a potential of use. Um, and I'm I'm somewhat cramped, and White has got more space. Yeah, that that's a great uh, great summary. So I think what you'll want to do here is keep that bishop pair open, and you're probably going to look for a dynamic game and castle queenside, maybe even like use the uh, G file to attack the White King if he ends up over there. And definitely you want the bishop pair on, because if the bishop pair comes off, then maybe the kind of ugly f-pawns will start to be an issue later, and you won't have enough compensation for them. So yeah, I think instead of b6, keep that b-pawn back, because you know the light square bishop can come out to the king side already. Um, you don't need that extra move to develop. Yeah, and here, um, I think knight to d7 is the way to go. Just kind of going back to that bishop pair point, because you can kick out that b5 bishop later. Yeah, I was probably bothered about bishops uh, c6, I think. So. Which is okay. Um, a little annoying for now, right? Your rook has to move, but yeah, I think you can get out of it. I hear you mentioned another pawn move. <laughs> That's bishop takes d7. Yeah, I, was, I just thought it was ridiculous when I was showing this game, you know. But in the game, I wasn't thinking about it. Yeah, and sometimes too, like um, the mindset in a chess game can really mean a lot. Like for whatever reason, there was just something in your mind that had you going down this path of pushing the pawns, um, and sometimes you can kind of just get you know, stuck going down one path and not kind of taking a fresh look at the board. And one thing I like to do in over-the-board chess, which I haven't really thought about too much for online play, because I don't play a lot of real slow games, if you ever find that mentally you're struggling a little bit during the game, like something's frustrating or your opponent confused you and maybe you're upset about it, or you're just not seeing the board very clearly, um, and over the board chess, one thing I always like to do is I'll get up and walk around. Like, go get a drink, go to the bathroom, come back, and just try to really look at it with a fresh mind and say, okay, pretend it's a brand new position. What should the plan be here? Um, and I think that's something you can do with online chess, too. Like, go take a lap around the, the room or, you know, go get a glass of water and come back and try to, you know, look from a fresh pair of eyes. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good idea. Okay, what am, what am I going to say about this move, Bob? It takes B3. <laughs> uh, I'm giving my good pieces away again, I think. So. Uh -huh. And you're also jumping to be the one to capture, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, just like if you learn that from one game, the, just the capture thing or the just comparing the two minor piece thing, that alone can take you really far in future games because that will be on your mind. Yeah, it is already, so... <laughs> <laughs> You're probably like, Matt, stop harping on that. <laughs> okay, this is good. Going for the attack. F4. Yeah, so you mentioned here that the, the bishop is ruined, you said. Um, he gets trapped behind these pawns on the dark squares. So I think mm. you're exactly right. Taking on E4 would be better to give this bishop some life. And if you could trade off that bishop for the knight, is that something you would want to do? Um, 
well, the knights got more scope, I think, in this pawn structure than my bishops. So uh, I think I would because it, it, the bishop was a bit useless. Yeah, indefinite. So definitely after f4, you want that trade. Um, after f takes e, I think you could go either way on this trade because if this pawn pushes up, and maybe you'll even throw it up as a sacrifice later, now that bishop becomes really strong, attacking the white king. Hey. So I really like what you did here. King d7, that's a high level move, just kind of appreciating that the king is safe there and connecting the rooks to attack. But I would say this is kind of the last critical moment. Rook to a7. So do you remember what your idea here is with rook a7? Uh, I, I think I was probably going to try and push pawns and get a, go down the a-file, I think. Like maybe double. Um, hope, yeah, hopefully before um, the pawns come down the g and h file for white. And if you look at like what happened in the game, was white able to create a passed pawn? Um, well, that that was the option, wasn't it? So, but that's that's what I was fearing. So, but so I have uh, I just looked at this game. You might not remember, but he did. He didn't have the option to make the pass pawn because you do have two here guarding two. Yeah. So the biggest risk is actually the pieces attacking you more than a pass pawn, right? Right. Um, so what you can do here, you have this really cool move. You can play king to c8. Sorry, instead of rook a7. King to c8. Now let's give white the same line he played in the game. g5, h takes g, h takes g, bishop e7, g6. So this is following the game line. Here you have this option of playing the king to b7 if white attacks you. So you could right. throw in that check, for example, and play king b7. Now, do you see any good way for white to continue the attack? Um, well, my king's a lot safer now than it was in the game. So, um, they white has to go for c c seven pawn, I suppose, or maybe. Um, it's not very easy for them, right? So, I think no. So here you're in pretty good shape. You got this A pawn coming, your rook's pinning. Um, so this takeaway is more about the king's safety, just kind of being aware of how strong the attack is. But I'm guessing because you mentioned the clock in a couple moves, you were probably already thinking a little bit about the time pressure too, right? Yeah, I was, I was getting, I was just slow in this, slow in this game. So then at this point, it kind of gets into like a tactical slugfest. Um, queen a2, you mentioned here that you overlooked rook a3. And I think you're right. Playing a3 here is very strong because um, this lost you some critical time. And then all of a sudden, white's coming at you with this really crazy idea, but it's nice. The rook takes d5 followed by a, a knight fork. Yeah, I just completely missed it, and I couldn't... I, I... It sort of rattled me a little bit, so I, I probably didn't think straight after <laughs> after a few other things that you probably see from the next few moves. It surprised me too when I was looking at this game. I didn't, you know, I thought, okay, so you lost a move or two, maybe one, maybe one tempi, right, with queen a two, but I didn't see how strong this idea was. Rookie six, I, I didn't see the move at all. Actually, this is just kudos to your opponent. That's a really nice idea. Okay, so I'm fast forwarding a bit through here. There's one kind of critical point coming up. Okay, so right. Yeah, here... th yeah go ahead. Right, okay. I thought it was all over at this stage. I was just, um, yeah, not, not probably looking at anything. I was just lost. So do you see the move um, that actually can give you an advantage here? You still. This was. Uh, so he was up like plus three the last. Uh, six or seven moves, but you have a move here that can give you an advantage. Uh, 
I don't know, pushing pushing the acorn, perhaps. I don't know. It's actually rook to h1 check. One, right. Ah, right, okay. And what this does is it draws the king away. Now you play b4. And how does white stop this past pawn? It's not right, a, it's okay. not a win for yeah. black, but I think it's like a one pawn advantage according to Stockfish, right? So it's there's a lot of play here, but it gave you the advantage, so, which was kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, I I I I thought it was uh, yeah I I hadn't seen it, so I hadn't seen it at all. So that's b four e takes d, rook takes d five. Yeah, so here this is going to be hard to, to do anything with that pass pawn. Okay, so then here you had three takeaways again. Number one, time management. Number two, end game technique. And number three, um, you said you don't analyze variations well, sometimes overlooking obvious defensive moves for the opponent. And your risk radar is faulty because um, sometimes you thought you had chances. Yeah, so the risk radar... I think this is something that all players tend to struggle with, where it's when both sides are attacking at the same time, it, it's a very difficult thing. Um, and I think the more examples you have of like tactical games, so that's where like the Art of Attack book is pretty handy, uh, the better you can get at those positions. But I think with your playing style, um, you really do well when you have a solid position. So that's something where you can try to avoid some of these slugfests and create situations where if your opponent plays the moves that you believe are best, your position is still solid. And if they get a crazy attack, it's because they've made some concessions and you know you should have the advantage. It's just on converting. So if you can try to create those scenarios, you can keep the game in a more solid position. Like... Um, when I play players that are just extremely aggressive, that's what I try to do. Right? I try to play solid and almost kind of look for their aggressive moments that they could go for and make sure that they're all what I believe is bad for the opponent. If you can try to do that. I sort of like waiting for them to punch themselves out or, or, or just go wrong you know, in, right. in their time. Right, but not necessarily playing passive, right? So you can still play in your solid and, and active style which it seems like you have that style. Um, but yeah, let them punch themselves out while you're while you're still playing active. Okay, okay. That's, that's, that's a good way of uh, thinking about it. Yeah, so another uh, great job on the takeaways, I would say. So like I mentioned to you before we uh, joined on this call, you know, I think you're probably 95% of the way there, Bob. Like, you could almost do less notes in terms of like finding a good balance between time playing and analysis. But I think your your takeaways are great. I like them a lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time that I'd really sat down and, and done notes uh, on games that I played. It's probably more for my own benefit, just the, the extra commentary because it's just been such a long time since I played um and i just wanted to sort of get the best learning out of um essentially what was a weekend of playing five chess games really so but it took me quite a while so i really analyzed <laughs> three of them so. yeah they're a big time commitment the weekend events it's cool that you have like an otb event played online like this I, I like that a lot um so part of bob's homework is going to be to analyze the last two games and maybe we'll put those in a video later bob if if we're both up for it <laughs> but what would you say uh, absolutely, oh, absolutely. So, what would you say based on the three that we've looked at today what are the common themes across the games uh well uh time um time management for me my, my takeaways and also the, the the other thing we'd notice um was just me giving up um positional advantage and not not properly assessing that in, in my play uh, would be one of the things I've, I've noticed from what we've just spoken about. Mm -hmm. And that could be probably split into two main areas, the uh, minor piece imbalances and the pawn structure. Because I think in both games there was something with the pawns 
uh, or in two of the games, I should say, and then the minor piece imbalances, that's something that every single game I'm thinking about. <laughs> right. And then the third one, I would say, which is more minor, um, is those trades. You know, maybe err on the side of not doing a trade. And this is one of my own personal takeaways. That's why it, it stands out to me in games now. Um, I trade too much. So kind of the similar thing for you, maybe tend to not be the person to initiate the trade. Yeah, no, that that's definitely fair comment. I mean, I, I did feel like I just gave up my queens uh, when I really uh, I needed to retain retain them on the board or, or give up my more active piece for a lesser piece without properly thinking if it was a good trade or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up the YouTube video here. So if you're watching on YouTube, uh, thanks for watching. Um, if, if you're not a subscriber, please click the subscribe button. Uh, and leave a comment below. Let us know what you think of Bob's games, the takeaways. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.